All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Tolman, and this is uh, part of my 19th century uh, European history um, uh, program. Uh, it's really interesting kind of starting this topic because when I talk about it with my students in the classroom, I clarify to them that, you know, the Industrial Revolution never actually ended. I mean, it, it, there is no beginning and end. I know I put 1900. <laughs> it's a very arbitrary number. I simply put that number there for the fact that, um, you know, my program technically ends at the end of the 19th century, although uh, it does include the First World War, so really it goes up to 1918. But uh, aside from that, um, it's never really stopped. I mean, you think about you know, the development of industries, and you think about, you know, the industries that developed in Europe and in North America during World War I, the interwar period, World War II, when I think about the nuclear age, that's all part of development in, in industry. Uh, and when you get to the modern age, when we, well, our modern 21st century age, you start talking about computers and cell phones and, and uh, internet and Wi-Fi, that's all part of sort of this continuum of the march of, of the age of industry. One of the things I find interesting about this period of history, particularly when we're looking at the 19th century predominantly, is the, the, the domino effect of things that it impacts beyond just the development of factories. I mean, you know, you see this mass migration of people from the countryside coming into the cities to seek employment in these new things called factories. You see, as Marx would say, the proletarianization of labor occur in the cities, the birth of the working class. I mean, Marxism would have been irrelevant and it probably never would have been uh, written about by Karl himself had he not been reflecting on the incredible social consequences of the Industrial Revolution on working people. Uh, when I think about uh, the implementation and the acceleration of, of interest in the public school system, the birth of the daycare, uh, the, 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 the greater awareness of public opinions, the stratification of European society amongst the class levels. I mean, although those classes existed, they become more sort of acute or more, more pronounced uh, as European society begins to develop. So, you know, it's more than sort of just uh, the factories. It, the, the, the ripple effect is tremendous and also keep in mind, and we'll talk about the agricultural revolution because the industrial revolution wouldn't have happened the way it did without the agricultural revolution. In fact, the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution are sort of two halves of the same walnut. So lots of very interesting things to sort of reflect on and talk about. Question is though, Why Britain? Why did it start there? Why not France? Why not Germany? Why not Imperial Russia? Why not the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Um, there are several factors why I believe and why most historians would argue why the age of industry really came out of Great Britain. Uh, hopefully my text you can see okay because I've got quite a few points so I've had to, you know, the size of my font will oftentimes be determined by the amount of points I have on each slide, so hopefully you can read that okay. Uh, Britain was the first to fully move toward industrialization and they would inspire others, so that becomes a domino effect. Certainly when the French and when the Germans and the Belgians and others began to see what was happening in Great Britain, you know, the ideas begin to percolate. Britain, though, had a good supply of people willing to work. They uh, and the farmers who were replaced by machines in the country also needed work. So that's part of that migration is that the mechanization of agriculture uh, made the amount of, of farmers um, irre uh, not irrelevant, but it made them, uh, they, they weren't needed, as many of them anyway. So they ended up moving to the cities. They had an influential middle class, talking Great Britain here, who were pro-business minded and given more political power. It's fair to say that of all the European nations in the middle of the 19th century, that Great Britain had the most well-developed middle class. A lot of that, of course, was a result of the fact that they were the, the first major European power to sort of move towards constitutionalism well before the French Revolution. Uh, and they had their share of bloodshed in the Glorious Revolution. We'll come back and look at the, the uh, development of British 
constitutionalism another time, but for the most part, um, they had a very, very, really strong business-minded middle class, and that really fueled this idea of economic development. So there were a lot of uh, interests in, in, in advancing um, agricultural technology and industrial technology as well. Britain had a massive colonial network, which of course was huge in this process. India, the crown jewel of the British Empire. Canada, before and after we received dominion status in 1867, uh, where it was a huge uh, a, a resource. You know, you think about Canada with the amount of the trees and fish and furs and everything else. Uh, and of course the tremendous contributions of New France and what they were developing, uh, mind you that was of course helping France certainly more than it was Great Britain, but the British North American colonies before Confederation were very, very well developed. Um, and Australia of course as well, in all these major colonies there were cheap resources made for good conditions in business and opportunity. Britain also had a significant amount of coal, which became the fuel of industry. And once someone figured out that you could actually use coal as a heat source to fuel these um, new inventions, uh, that just opens up a huge amount. Steam, steam power, of course, we'll talk about as well. Together, these factors would make the Industrial Revolution possible. So these are kind of like the main uh, things that would, that would explain why Great Britain would become the place where uh, this, this uh, huge advancements in technological development would take off as well. All right, so um, the Industrial Revolution ushered in the modern age, as we would call it, and the belief that unlimited material progress was at hand. Here, of course, is a, a picture of factories, the smoke. A couple of things I want to say before we continue is that when factories begin to be built and people with capital begin to build these things or have these things built for them and they become the owners of these means of production, these factories, there were little to no regulations. These, these factory owners were not really beholden to any type of regulations, no labor standards, no wage standards, they could pay people for the most part whatever they wanted, they could provide tenement housing for these people, or tenant housing rather, uh, which was often horrible living conditions for these people. And unfortunately because in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution there was such a serious lack of protections for working people at the time, it sort of brings out the very selfish um, uh, opportunistic side of people. And I'm not saying that capitalism does that. It certainly can. Of course, later there would be implemented labor laws and, 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 and wage, uh, you know, minimum wage uh, um, payments and things like that. So, so things do change eventually. But in the early days, you know, the, the, uh, the amount of exploitation was tremendous. I mean, that's what Karl Marx himself was looking at. Karl Marx was a byproduct, a child of, if you will, you've heard me use that phrase before, a child of the Industrial Revolution. Marxism would be irrelevant and would probably never, Marx never would have even thought about writing the things he did had he not been observing London, Paris, um, Berlin and other major centers where Industrial Revolution was, was sort of uh, creating tremendous uh, social and economic hardship for people in these cities. The other piece too, which we'll talk about later, was the tremendous environmental fallout. Nobody was thinking that all this crud in the air was going to be uh, breathed in, and people were going to start suffering from breathing issues and bronchial problems. I mean, certainly people in factories were not necessarily wearing masks when they were inhaling dust particles from, from all kinds of things that were being made. I mean, um, there just wasn't anything in place to help people understand that the, 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 the way in which they were working and the conditions in which they worked was actually contributing to their ill health. I mean, eventually people began to figure that the crap they were breathing in in the factory was contributing to their chronic cough and later lung cancer, whatever it is, was that they might develop. But in the early days, you know, it, it, they were just marching along and, 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 uh, and uh, it, it shouldn't be surprising that there were people who were observing these conditions who became advocates 
uh, and of course Karl Marx being the big one. Um, Charles Dickens, of course. You look at something like A Christmas Carol, one of the classic English pieces of literature of this period. You know, really very much that story is about the greed and the selfishness that, 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 that unlimited uh, possibilities of earning capital could do to human nature. And Ebenezer Scrooge in many ways would be kind of a perfect example of that. So a lot of interesting things going on. All right, let's move on. Unprecedented social, economic, and political changes in the organization of society occurred with the introduction of machines and industry. As I've talked about just now, absolutely huge changes. Uh, coinciding with these changes arose a new social organization attuned to individual rights and freedoms. Okay, so the lecture after this one is going to deal with the um, advancements of, in ideology in political parties. What you do see develop is you see different levels of political parties develop. Now Marx, of course, uh, in his Communist Manifesto of 1848 would talk about workers' revolution. Uh, liberals would talk about the importance of freedom of speech, the, free, the right to vote, freedom of religion, uh, individual liberties, if you will, the hallmark of the American Revolution and also the French Revolutions. Um, conservatism and so on and so forth. So you begin to see this understanding that there is an obligation by humanity through the guise of government, if you will, or through the lens of government that needs to be to some degree responsible for the basic welfare of humanity. And I think that's one of the remarkable things about the age of industry is it really forces nations to confront um, this reality that, that a lot of people who are working in these factories are living in absolutely atrocious conditions. And to what extent is it the government's responsibility to ensure certain uh, safety, uh, safety um, uh, laws, if you will, to protect these people? Societies like Britain and Germany that became industrial in nature developed an urban culture more advanced than those who remain largely agrarian. So you have put all these people in the city, you see some working people doing better than others, it's like you've got an upper middle class and a middle middle class and a lower middle class, you've got all these different tiers and you know all these people were aspiring to to be upper class and oftentimes the middle classes of Great Britain would masquerade as upper class citizens because that would be there in their dress, in their, you know, you see the, the, the development of uh, manners and the Victorian culture, all that is sort of happening during this age of industry. <clears throat> all right, so Industrial Revolution began in England as we said around 1760 in textile factories where steam power was first used in woolen and cotton industries. Okay, so we're going back to the beginning here, textiles fabrics, cloth, things like that. This gave Britain global economic dominance for nearly a century. Okay, So when we're talking about textiles, we're talking about you know, the ability to make um, materials that could make shirts and pants and socks and underwear and coats and all that other stuff, you know, that Great Britain had access to all these resources. I mean, they didn't necessarily have the resources that would contribute to their advancement on their own, but certainly India, Canada, Australia, and others did. So, so they had no lack of cheap, cheap resources um, that they would exploit from their colonies to bring back to the mother country to be um, used in the development of their industries. It saw machines substitute human labor in all methods of production. A dramatic shift from rural villages to urban centers. As I said, there's that great migration of people looking for opportunity. Uh, the, 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 once they began to mechanize their textile industries, <clears throat> you know, it changes everything. I mean, I don't want to get too much into it, but before the Industrial Revolution, you know, you had this sort of system called the putting out system, I think it was called. Hall. I'd have to look back, but it's been a while since I've taught this in a, in a classroom. But, um, you know, in the old days, you know, you'd have somebody who owned the, 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 the wool and he would go to a family and say, here's a bundle of wool. 
I'll be back on Tuesday. I need, you know, 10 shirts and three pairs of socks. I'll pay you this much. They would come back, they'd take those things, and then they'd sell them, right? So the putting out system was very much a family-based economy because they would be the children and mom and to what extent, I don't know, dad helped in this, but I don't, I don't know, maybe in some cases he did. But they would be hired to produce these materials from the raw wool, and then they would be given a certain amount of money in doing that. Then the, then the owner of the material would come pick it up and go sell it privately. Well now, you don't need that kind of system. You don't need that family-based textile industry because you can now create a factory where you can run 20 spindles on one machine instead of one human one spindle. So and we'll talk more about the spinning jenny and things like that later. So effectively what happens is you see a, a huge increase in the production of, of the textile, the clothing industries. Improved standard of living for many, except the workers who did the labor, of course. This is the irony. The ones that were actually producing the things that were generating profits were the ones who uh, benefited the least. And this is, of course, centerpiece to Marx's argument. And we'll talk in great detail about the rise of Marxism, if you will, in my next lecture dealing with ideology. The concentration of power within industrialized countries uh, was tremendous uh, because, you know, the only people that were in a position to open a factory and rent the space or buy the space would be people with money. And, you know, if you were, at, if you were getting into the factory business in the dawn of this era, when it's really beginning to grow, these individuals became extremely wealthy because then they have the capital to open up a second, a third, and fourth factory. So power is really, capital is sort of concentrated into really very few hands. I feel like I'm reading out of the textbook of the Communist Manifesto. But I mean, you know, a lot of what Marx was arguing was kind of common sense, and, and a lot of it, his observations were correct. You know, the critique of, of Marxism later is more about the solution for rectifying these situations that, that would cause major problems. But in terms of his analysis of this is what's wrong and this is why it's wrong and this is why profit is causing these people uh, difficulty was largely correct um, in, his, in, in the observation. Now, there's lots to quibble pros and cons of Marxism. We'll do that another time. But, uh, the development of new ideologies, here we go to deal with massive changes, and then of course Marxism falls into it, the birth of uh, a, well, liberalism, if you will, conservatism, nationalism, social democracy uh, would be a big one because there are a lot of people that like the ideas of socialism, but were not necessarily revolutionary minded, they were more interested in sort of, um, you know, the Fabian Society we'll talk about in another lecture as well. Sort of progressive, democratically inclined social democratic parties really grow in the late 19th century as well. All right, so in England, demand for cotton goods outstripped supply, and the cottage industry, the putting out system we talked a bit about, where work was parceled out among craftspeople and villages, could not meet demand. So that idea of family based you know, industries in the home could not uh, uh, produce enough to meet the demand. So it was really the demand for these materials that pushed along these inventions. In Lancashire, manufacturers began to think in terms of centralizing production in one factory. You know, you've got a spinning jenny or you've got, uh, you know, a water frame or whatever you've got. You wouldn't have a water frame in a factory, but, uh, or would you? I'd have to look at that. But either way, you've got a big open space like a gymnasium and you've got 50 of these machines running 100 or 20 spindles per machine. I mean, the output is, is astronomical. The, the, the efficiency of space, the, the minimal hands-on human labor required, uh, you can imagine what that does to profit. So, Hargreaves spinning jenny, here we go spun several threads at once, and Arkwright's water frame, I think that's a water frame, that's a spinning jenny, held up to 100 power spindles. Okay, so for example here, you can see all these spindles here. If one person works the machine and it can, it can create 20 
you know, uh, spindles of, of threading at a time that formerly would require 20 people. Well, once again, you can imagine the tremendous efficiency. You have 50 or 100 of these machines with 50 to 100 laborers in an open factory like a gymnasium. Uh, well, you can do the math, right? It's pretty remarkable. So the spinning jenny was a huge, huge uh, invention. Of course, the water frame as well. Okay, let's see here. In 1799, steam power was harnessed to the whole mechanical process. And the steam power piece is interesting. It's the idea that if you can, if you can find steam, of course it creates pressure. And if you slowly release that pressure, it can fuel things to move, right? And, you know, once they were, once people were, in, were able to harness the pressure of steam power, wow, that is a huge, huge game changer. And that's where, um, you know, and that could be steam by uh, water steam or, or coal, I think would be the, the use of the heat source to create the steam the water. Workers left their villages to urban areas where factories were built, also encouraged by the mechanization of agriculture, which required less human labor. So what's happening in the cities, in these factories, in terms of the mechanization of these industries, is also happening, of course, on the farmland or the, the, uh, the, uh, the land owned by, you know, landlords, and we'll talk about that. Shortly. Yeah, the agricultural revolution, there we are. Was a movement towards enclosures, larger fields, increased production, and made them more profitable. Also, village lands called commons began to become privatized, so owned with the purposes of, of profiting from, as wealthier farmers bought up property and pushed poor farmers out. You know, you've got these sort of stratified levels of, 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 of farmers. You know, I often think about the kulaks in Russia, you know, these wealthier peasants and then you get the poor peasants and the wealthier peasants exploit the poor peasants and so on and so forth. But if you own land and you had access to capital that you could purchase things like a seed drill, which we'll talk about shortly, um, you can really maximize your profits by making how you grow uh, produce more efficient. The profit motive took over from collective good as farming became more mechanized. The farmers pushed off their land would be pushed into the cities which were flooded with unemployed farmers and families. I mean, you know, it's not like uh, they were just free-for-all jobs. I mean, once those factories were full and once people had jobs, you know, you have, a, you have more people flooding into the cities than there are jobs available, which leads to vagrancy, which leads to theft and poverty and street people and, and filth and you name it. I mean, it, it, I just can't imagine how difficult life would have been for these people whose lives have been completely disrupted in the city and in the farm by this shift towards uh, modernization to the mechanization of industries. Those in the cities could be fed uh, because the enclosed farms produce much more so that's that, that relationship because you've mechanized agriculture, because you've increased production, you've also produced enough that can now feed these very very overpopulated cities as well. The agricultural revolution changed the look of the English countryside and helped to create and support the industrial revolution. Okay, so I'm hoping you're beginning to see that cause and effect relationship that they're, how, how the agricultural revolution is fueling the industrial revolution as well. Okay, let's look at uh, the new technologies in the uh, agricultural sphere. English, 18th century, biggest popular, biggest popularizers, if you will, of earlier innovations were Robert Bakewell. All right, he improved methods of animal breeding, producing more meat and thicker wool. Robert Bakewell was the one that sort of, and I think these ideas had been percolating for some time, but he really articulated the idea that if your animals were healthy and strong, 
um, they would be more efficient on the, in the countryside, on the farms. If they were healthier and strong, they produced a better wool product, if you will, in the case of sheep. Um, in the case of meat, the quality of the meat would be better if the animal, animal if the cows were stronger and healthier. So I think Bakewell's contribution is the recognition that if you breed certain horses with other horses that are healthy, they will produce healthy babies. I mean, there's no other way to put this. Um, so the idea of, of breeding animals with the sole purposes of increasing production of a variety of things. Better bred animals were available to those who could afford it, though. Of course, they, anybody that who's watching this who's involved in the horse industry, and my daughter and my wife both uh, come from a family of avid lovers of horses, and, uh, you know, the expense, holy mackerel, you want to buy a purebred horse, <clears throat> um, you're going to pay. You're going to pay for these things. So, Charles Turnip Townsend. <clears throat> Uh, instituted crop rotation with wheat, turnips, barley, and grasses. This replaced the fallow field with one sown with a crop that both restored nutrients to the soil and provided animal fodder. Okay, a couple of words here you might not be familiar with. Let me just explain. Let's use an example of a square. Imagine a square, and I'm just using this as an analogy. So, Okay, a square with cut into four quarters. You've got four squares within a big square. You've got barley in one, wheat in one, uh, it doesn't matter, turnips and grasses, okay? So one year they're in their square. The next year you shift those and that the nutrients of the fallow of one will feed the next. You get what I'm saying? So the, the, the fallow from turnips would be um, would help barley grow. The fallow from barley would help the grasses grow. And if you rotate those crops from season to season, you're putting nutrients back into the soil, right? You're, divi you're diversifying your agriculture and you're producing better products, right? So crop rotation. Remarkable how these people figure this stuff out. Um, so crop rotation was huge. Jethro Tull, one of my favorite English bands uh, uh, from the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, Ian Anderson, he's the one that played the flute. Aqualon, Locomotive Breath. I'll have to come back and do the history of music another time. Um, in fact, when I was a kid listening to Jethro Tull, I had no idea that Jethro Tull was an actual person. But, nonetheless, agricultural experimenter, he invented the seed drill and learned the importance of enriching the soil with fertilizer and manure. So in many ways, Jethro Tull probably took a couple of tips from what uh, Turnip Townsend was doing. They were around at the same time. You can see they were born the same year. I'm sure they would have been aware of each other. The seed drill. Let me explain this. This is huge. Seed drill here is a system that punches the seed into the earth on a cyclical uh, you know, pattern, every foot or whatever it might be. What that means is that you can create line upon line upon line upon line of, let's use corn as an example, up one lane, down another, they can be tucked in really tightly to each other, you have maximized your space and you've made it very, very efficient. You know, it's like when you drive around, certainly out here in the, in the, in the late summer, you can see out on uh, the peninsula here, uh, lots of corn being grown and you can just see how it's all row upon row upon row, that is a byproduct of this invention, or at least the thinking of this invention. In the old days, they used to just throw seed on the ground, you know, in a random fashion, and things would grow here and there. Sometimes the seed would be blown away. Sometimes the birds would come and eat the seed. So you never really knew what you were going to get. This determines that it's punched into the earth and that it's going to grow in a very organized fashion. <clears throat> Enclosures, improved breeding, cultivation, fertilization, uh, careful seeding, crop rotation, all made farms so much more productive. The idea of manure, right? I mean, who is the one? I mean, how did Jethro Tull come to terms with, well, maybe if we put horse poop on these fields, it'll help. I think he understood. <clears throat> 
that the animals were eating all the fallow, which is, the fallow is like the residue of what you want. So if you take off the corn, then the stalk is fallow, right? Um, that's left to sort of uh, slowly disintegrate, or, you know, because it's biodegradable. Anyway, goes back, reintroduces re nutrients in, into the soil. So <coughs> all these things, and the use of manure in particular is fascinating. He, as, I, as I said earlier, coming back to it, that he must have figured out that since these horses were eating all these things, that there might be some nutritive value to this, and he was correct, of course. So, pretty amazing. The growth of towns and cities was directly connected to these advancements. So, the, the, once again, the domino effect that now these cities are growing, the farms are becoming more and more efficient, more is being grown, more people being fed, the agricultural revolution is fueling the industrial revolution as well. They're feeding each other, so it just grows on itself. <coughs> Manchester and Liverpool changed from sleepy little country towns into bustling cities filled by many farming families who no longer had farms. I mean, Manchester becomes a real flashpoint for the horror of the Industrial Revolution. To, you know, and you got to consider, too, the, uh, the, uh, the residue from these factories, the tailings or all the other stuff, is being dumped into the rivers. And people are, you know, drinking from rivers that are now polluted. That's another thing. You, they weren't just polluting the sky with the smoke. They were polluting all the rivers as well. So, um, you know, once people began to realize what was going on, then people began to, ad be began to rather advocate for change. All right, there, yeah, there's the seed drill there. You can see there's the little funnel that punches. So these wheels, these spindles, you know, they rotate, it pushes it down every foot or whatever, however they've got it set, and you just roll this thing in a straight line, it'll punch seed directly into the earth. The other thing, too, I didn't mention, failed to mention before, is that it's way more efficient than just tossing it because you don't need as much of it because every seed, you're, you're actually designating a location for that seed. So, yeah, that, <laughs> wow, remarkable invention. Wow, steam. James Watt, Scottish engineer and a machine maker who expanded on a machine invented by uh, Thomas Newt Coleman, who harnessed compressed steam as a power source, and we talked about that earlier. <coughs> Provided for the first time in history a steady and virtually unlimited source of inanimate power, a source that doesn't tire, right? Humans tire. We get tired after a while. We need a break. We need a glass of water. I could use a glass of water right now for that matter. I <clears throat> don't have one handy. But, um, you know, that as long as you keep fueling it with steam or coal or whatever, it's just going to keep running. You know, so when you maintain it, uh, it, it will run and run and run and run. Portable source of power not dependent on nature and as a mineral based energy, never tired. Industrial applications diversified from industry to transportation, right? And we get into railroads, of course. Um, used initially to pump water from mines, Watt adopted the engine so that it could drive machines which powered the factory age, right? Using compressed steam because there's a lot of tension. It's like a boiling pot, you know, you got to take the lid off to let the steam off using that tension and that pressure to make things, pistons for example, to move up and down. So, pretty remarkable. Well, if there was any byproduct of the mechanization of industry that was more pervasive than any other, I'd say the development of railroads would have been one of the most significant uh, offshoots of the use of steam and coal power. So. Industrial advance and the migration that followed greatly contributed to the first great age of railway building. Improving roads was first, and the turnpike method mastered by James McAdam saw roads slightly sloped so rain would spill off. Interesting thing. So, you know, horse and buggy still. The idea is that your road isn't just flat because then you're going to end up with puddling and then you're going to end up with mud and mess. 
you have your road that's slightly so the water runs off. You get a ditch, if you will. Seems simple, seems straightforward, but somebody had to think of it first. And of course, in this case, James McCadden would have been the one to say to make our roads more efficient. Also, using compressed um, stone, if you will, packed down, would also be more efficient than just dirt roads of mud. Um, but the idea of having that road slope had a significant impact on transportation before the railway. Railways built in England, in addition to improved canals and roads, increased mobility of peoples. The canal system in Great Britain cannot be understated. It often gets overlooked in the narrative of the Industrial Revolution, but if you want to move stuff from the factory to a port, for example, um, it was going to be way more efficient if you could put it on a little ship and send it down a canal to uh, to a dock at uh, Bristol or, or wherever it might be. So the canal system became very, very well developed as well as the road system. Easier and faster movement of people and products like raw materials and finished goods reduced prices and increased demand. Okay, now here's where the consumer wins, right? The more you produce, the, the cheaper things are. The cheaper things are, the more people that can afford to buy them. Supply, demand, right? You are seeing this industry, industrial system just eating on itself, right? It's fueling and fueling. People are getting wealthier. They're buying bigger homes. They're buying nicer clothes because they're cheaper to buy because they've been made in a factory. Um, you know, it goes on and on and on. The, the, the trickle down of, 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 um, of benefits for, for people but not necessarily the working people. That's the irony. The people that were producing this stuff were the ones that benefited from the least. The, the, the ever-growing middle and upper classes, of course, really were, were um, benefiting from these industrial advancements. Birth of the railways brought even more industrialization by increasing demand for iron and steel and more labor. And here's the other thing, is now that you've got efficient railway systems and networks running all through Great Britain, you can take stuff from Bristol to Liverpool, from Liverpool to London, from London to Leeds to Leeds to Manchester. Things can move much more efficiently and much quicker, which as well is fueling the age of industry. So hopefully you're beginning to understand that, that ripple effect of how quickly things are, are becoming more efficient. Right? And, and it's creating a lot of wealth and a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity for people. Iron ships and machinery replaced wood. Industrialization had begun to grow on itself. And once we move from wood to iron, boy, the ships become much more solid, much heavier, of course, as well, but much more reliable. <clears throat> so. Factory age. So new inventions made the cottage industries obsolete. Of course, they were rendered pretty much irrelevant by this uh, time. New machines required factories to accommodate the need for space and power. We talked a little bit about that already. The factory system made Britain a wealthy and powerful country, but it was brutally hard on working people. Right? People had to relocate to the cities and live in large housing developments. And this is the thing, is if you moved to the city and you worked in a factory and you lived in your factory owner's uh, tenant housing, you were very, very much dependent on that job uh, because they provided your place of work, they provided your income, and they provided your housing. And, you know, if, if you got fired, you know, well, then you'd have to deal with finding a place for your women and your, your wife and your children. And what happens if you don't find another job? I mean, so people were really had to put up with a lot of abuse because the consequence of getting let go was, was too steep. Factories would include all aspects of manufacturing under one roof, like cloth where the raw fibers were cleaned, spun and woven in the same factory, so very efficient. In the old days in the cottage industries, each family might be hired to do one of these three tasks uh, separately. So, factory owners rarely had sympathy for those who labored long hours in dirty, noisy, and dangerous buildings. Um, yeah, so the exploitation was, was pervasive everywhere. 
And conditions in the early factory age was brutal with little job protections. And those kind of things would come. Um, definitely, uh, people began to advocate church groups, humanitarian groups, um, you know, progressive intellectuals, whoever, you know, would begin to really recognize that there needs to be a great reckoning in this, that, you know, we can't just continue to have our industries uh, born on the backs of, of labor that is being, you know, dying from, you know, lung cancer and, and, and ill health and, 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 and overwork and children getting stuck in chimneys because they're small. I mean, children were often hired in factories because they had small hands and that they could, they could you know, if, if a spinning jenny was clogged, they could put their hand in and, and, and fix it. But then, you know, so many kids lost fingers and, I mean, it's just grotesque. There were no labor standards for children yet either. That does come later. You know, children are working in factories being brutally exploited as well. And that's where advocates in Great Britain, I think, I think that's where it started, began to say, look, if we're going to allow children to work in these factories with their parents, then we as the state need to provide uh, some kind of education system so these people have the opportunity to eventually work their way out of this. So the, 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 the advocacy for a greater um, availability of, 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 of public-based education uh, really is born out of this age as well. All right, society and culture. So Britain had a rigid and complex class structure. Uh, class differences identified by wealth, income, and even accents, you know. Uh, so the way you spoke would oftentimes determine what social class you were in. Upper classes saw themselves as high society and the cream of society. Oftentimes these were factory owners or factory managers, that kind of thing wealthy lawyers. Middle classes saw fathers working in professions as doctors, engineers, lawyers, or as businessmen with property and money or military officers oftentimes are seen as middle classes. And this, as I said, was a very, very robust uh, uh, class of people. Lower middle class or white collar workers worked in stores and offices or owned small shops. And lower classes worked in trades or in a factory and also had rankings like skilled or unskilled and casual labor. So as I said earlier, in each social class you've got different variants of the middle, upper middle, lower middle, uh, and so on and so forth. So, Well, most of you who have sort of a basic understanding of the Industrial Revolution probably have that image of, of, of you know, a kid with a, with a black face and a sad face and, you know, uh, dirty and climbing up chimneys, that kind of thing. Yes, of course, that, that stereotype was, is, is important because um, that was the reality for many of these people. Uh, but it's uh, pretty unbelievable how long, you know, the, the British government and later the German and French government allowed these businesses to continue without any type of safety nets for these people uh, is quite remarkable. The poor lived in slums with families often living in one room. They were oftentimes didn't have windows, they had no ventilation, it was disease ridden, it was rat ridden, it was lice ridden, uh, it was not healthy, they, 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 they had limitations on cleanliness, they had no place to take a bath. Um, you know, or their teeth, brushing your teeth. I mean, the list goes on and on and on that, that these poor people were living truly in squalor. Growth of the city was so rapid that access to water, streets, and proper sanitation had not been planned, right? That's the thing. The migration of people was so fast that nobody thought, ah, sewage system, for example. I don't even want to go there. I'll let your imagination imagine that one. But, um, you know, access to clean water, you know, treatment centers, water centers, um, uh, pipelines that, that, that pumped clean water throughout these towns, uh, sewage systems, you name it. I mean, they come later, but initially there was no planning for those things. Crime was common and so was disease, especially cholera, spread through dirty water and epidemics occurred throughout Britain's cities. Britain's poor laws and existences since 
the 16th century did not work very well. Um, but when laws were reformed in 1834, it could not help the unemployed and poor effectively when numbers were in the thousands. So, Charity usually rested on the church and some were forced to move into workhouses where for shelter and food they would be given menial jobs. Um, the workhouses were like for unemployed people to do menial jobs for a meal, you know. Um, pretty horrible stuff. And as you can imagine, we talked about that mass migration, is that the cities had to begin to think about, my gosh, we never anticipated uh, clean water and sanitation and, and, and sewage and all these things. Uh, we gotta, we got to figure this out. Overcrowded and impoverished cities led many people to emigrate to overseas colonies like Canada and escape from poverty in the factory system. There is a huge migration, and I know certainly in Canadian history, and, and, and very much, I'm sure, in American history as well, from my American friends out there, that, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people came. When you look at the Irish after the potato famine, how many Irish came to Canada and to the United States? Thousands did, right? They were fleeing the hardships there. A lot of people came to Canada, and, you know, you gotta consider that Great Britain in terms of its size, when you look at the size of Great Britain compared to Canada or the United States, I mean, for example, the province of British Columbia, to give you an example, the province of British Columbia is three times the size of all the British Isles. And that's one province. I mean, I think people knew that when they left Great Britain for, say, Canada or the U.S., they knew that they were coming to a country that had vast landscapes, that had vast forests and farmlands and, and fish and whatever it might be, you know, is it any wonder that these people came to these countries and some colonies, right? So because there were going to be a lot more opportunities for these people. Colonial governments often gave free land to encourage immigrants, but frontier life had challenges too, and we're going to talk about frontier life when we talk about uh, uh, some other uh, Canadian history uh, lectures down the road, um, you know, what an enticement that is. You come to Canada, we're going to give you X amount of acres of free land, but oftentimes when these people arrive, they didn't realize that, oh, it's forested, we got to cut these trees down, we got to pull the roots out, we got to build our own home, and my gosh, you better do it before winter, because when the winter comes, it's going to get ugly, but uh, yeah, frontier life in North America was, was harsh, but uh, once they were able to, to develop roots and, and, and build their homes and, and, and get their farms going, life could be very, very fruitful. Lots of fresh air, lots of clean water, lots of fish in the ocean and in the rivers and lakes, a lot of protein in the form of animals in the forests. I mean, holy mackerel, North America uh, provided a, a huge opportunity for people, though, that were willing to work very, very hard as well, because it was not easy. In Ireland, the introduction of the potato from the New World became the staple food of Irish peasants while their wealthy English lords grew grain for export. And in 1845, Ireland, the potato suffered a disease or blight which led to starvation of the peasants. Many fled to England or to the colonies, right? We talked about that earlier. And that potato famine didn't just happen one year. And this is a perfect example of why you should never rely on one crop. Not only from a business point of view, but from a social point of view, from a you know, dietary point of view. Once that potato had been diseased, and that was their primary form of sustenance, that's why so many people starved. I mean, the Irish potato famine was a, a, a horrible tragedy. Uh, and many of those Irish came to Canada and the United States. In Scotland, poor peasants were displaced by clearances, the Highland clearances they were called when the move to enclosure saw lords evict poor tenant farmers. So a lot of Scots came to Canada and to, uh, not sure to what extent to the U.S., I'm sure quite a few did, but a lot came to Canada uh, because they were evicted from their lands because this was during the move when, when landowners began to realize that the mechanization of their industries could uh, lead to profits, not just, you know, in those days it was just about you own land and it, it had value, but now if you could produce something on that land that would would, would increase your profits in some way. Well, that's what they're going to do. 
Vacated farms were burned to prevent tenants from returning. Isn't that tragic? Well, we're going to make it absolutely useless to you. But then if they were going to use it for agriculture, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot. But I guess it was a way of clearing them out. Pretty tragic. So that's why in, in Canada's history, anyway, using that as an example, and like I say, I'm quite sure the U.S. as well, we have such a strong... Uh, history with Scottish immigrants and uh, Irish immigrants as well. So, all right. Well, that seems like a good place to stop. So, thank you so much for coming and having a look, and don't hesitate to comment. Um, also, uh, next lecture will deal with the um, development, the further development, if you will, of not only um, uh, political ideologies, but the development of political parties as well. So. Anyway, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.